Dr. Plymer is a, a doctorate in geology. He's a chair of the mining at the mining studies at uh, Adelaide. Uh, he is uh, an accomplished scholar, but also writer. And uh, I saw that on his biography that he has written a number of very popular books, including Heaven and Earth. Uh, it's an honor to have him as our final speaker today. Thank you, Doctor. Lost my. Can someone assist me? I don't know where you've hidden it here. And don't ask me to do it. Well, it is a pleasure to be the last speaker, and being the last speaker, I can actually use four-letter words because I'm leaving your country today, um, and the four-letter word which is an absolutely magnificent word, and it unites all geologists, it's the word time. And we geologists have a very different perspective on climate to those meteorologists. And let me, let me give you an example of perspective. I mean, it's just fabulous coming here to Chicago to come to the United States. And I come to this country and every single person has an accent. Isn't that incredible? Now that's perspective. We as geologists have a very different perspective and we love our volcanoes. And the ones that the IPCC use are the ones we see and we monitor those because they kill people. They explode and they kill people. And they release two major greenhouse gases, water vapour and carbon dioxide. That's where the stuff originally comes from. And when this planet formed on that Thursday, 4,567 million years ago, we started to leak out gases. And we are still doing it. And there are these two major areas where we leak these gases. A place I've worked on a lot is the island of Milos. It's a difficult place, but someone has to do it. And it is a volcanic island which has blasted itself into space a number of times. And we can see on the left-hand photograph, there's a gas cavity where we've had a massive gas explosion, we've had sudden expansion of gas, sudden freezing, some of these things can get to minus temperatures, and we've just blasted material into the atmosphere. And what are the gases? Steam and carbon dioxide. And the bottom right photograph shows one of these gas vent fields where we've just been burping out gas. They are the major greenhouse gases coming out. Top left, we can see there are old hot spring deposits, sinters, where we're having bubbling water coming out on the surface. Top right, we can see the platy crystals there were originally calcium carbonate. Since then, they've been replaced to silica. So we had a lot of carbon dioxide coming out of what was a fairly small, pathetic volcano that really only operated for about three million years. And to teach this, of course, I get there with my students and sitting in a hot spring, and I get them to measure how much carbon dioxide comes out of one hot spring. It is an enormous amount. And the white cliffs behind are because that volcano is exhaling acid. And you cook up acid with very common minerals, and you get clay. So we can start to look at these processes back in time and see that we've had a very, very active planet. And the, what I find absolutely amazing that the other side has suddenly realised that the planet is dynamic. And because it's in their lifetime, it's got to be due to them. Well, I've got news for you. It's been dynamic since that first Thursday, 4,567 million years ago. And it's still dynamic. And no matter what dial we want to try to twiddle, we won't be able to beat the forces of nature. So it's time to be a little bit humble or take a cold bath. As we see here in Turkey, these terraces of calcium carbonate. Now, that calcium carbonate, that is a precipitate from warm springs. That rock's got 44% carbon dioxide in it. This is where the world's carbon dioxide hides. It hides in rocks. We've got other precipitates there in Turkey. Very, very common to find these in volcanic areas. We can also see 
ancient volcanoes, the two on the left side, are from old postcards of sinter terraces where we've had mineral precipitates from hot springs, where we've had the odd steam explosion. On the top right is White Island, an active volcano, and we have steam vents. And, they, and we can measure what comes out of volcanoes. Surprise, surprise, it's water vapour, carbon dioxide, and a huge complexity of other compounds. But a lot of acid comes out of volcanoes, and we come to that in a minute. And we see, we can get underground, bottom right photograph, and we can get into these volcanoes, and you can see there's veins full of calcium carbonate. 44% carbon dioxide in it. And we can see this platy mineral specimen. It's telling us that we once had carbonate there. We've dissolved it. It's gone somewhere else. And so we've been recycling carbon since the beginning of time. So volcanoes give us a very, very good picture here in Chile. We can see the same thing, bottom right, where we've had carbonate, which was dissolved, and it's gone somewhere else. We can see these great lines of volcanoes along big fractures. And if people measure carbon dioxide coming out of, a, out of a volcano, they measure it in the vent. But what they don't measure are along these fractures. You have a constant leakage of carbon dioxide. It leaks out all the time. This is the way we can find volcanoes. And we know what they look like three-dimensionally. In the early 1980s, I was involved in a drilling program into an active volcano, and only the brave do that, uh, or you have to understand what happens deep down. And you can see deep down, there are fluids which are rich in carbon dioxide. We drilled 751.2 metres before we hit these fluids. And that is quite exciting work, hitting fluids at 300 degrees Celsius supercritical with a huge amount of gas. What are the gases? Water vapour and carbon dioxide. So we have an enormous amount of validated information from modern geothermal systems, from geothermal power stations and from looking at ancient rocks that a major gas coming out of our planet is carbon dioxide. And sometimes it comes out and explodes. And these sort of volcanoes are called Mars. And these Mars are where you have a huge gas explosion. And if you have this volume of carbon dioxide as liquid and expand it to gas, it, 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 will, it will fill this building. If you've got this volume of water and expand it to gas, it will fill this room. If you want to explode a rock, carbon dioxide's for you. And we see these carbon dioxide volcanoes all over the world. They're very, very common. And what do they leak out? carbon dioxide. What did the IPCC tell us about it? Nothing. We see at depth rocks that were granite. Um, since then they've been uplifted and exposed. Those rocks cool by losing heat through gas, by leaking out gases. It is an extraordinarily common rock type, granite. And to form granite before, during and after crystallisation, we lose gases, mainly carbon dioxide. So. These never go into any of the calculations done by the IPCC on the sources of carbon dioxide. But I'm only talking about pathetic volcanoes. Mount St Helens, which was nigh on 30 years ago, almost to the day, uh, that was small. The only reason it got a lot of publicity is it occurred in this country. It was small. It was at one cubic kilometre of material blasted into the air. Krakatoa in 1883 and 535 AD. That was 30 cubic kilometres. But there's some bigger ones. Tobar, a climate changing volcano. That was anything from 1,000 to 3,000. Tobar, bottom left. Yellowstone, some fabulous eruptions there. Much bigger. Taupo, and many of us pray that New Zealand gets vaporised, but uh, Taupo <laughs> has had some very, very big volcanoes. And these explosions are driven by gas. It's an expansion of gas. So we have supervolcanoes which we see in terrestrial environments, but they're nothing. They're absolutely nothing. They're not the volcanoes that we really, really have to worry about. It is the basalt volcanoes, and there's been a huge amount of experimental work. Much of it was done here in Chicago looking at how carbon dioxide and basalt behave. And you can dissolve up to 13% carbon dioxide in basalt. We've had these massive basalt flows in this country, in the Deccan traps in India and parts of Siberia. These are very rapid. They put out aerosols. They put out a lot of carbon dioxide. But they're not the big ones. The big ones are beneath the ocean. And they're not active at present. 
That doesn't mean they're not going to be active. They're not active at present. What they do is they change the shape of the ocean. They change ocean currents. They change the heat balance in the ocean. And they add things to the ocean, like carbon dioxide. It doesn't bubble to the surface because of its inverse solubility. So bottom right, dreadful photograph. Um, your glasses are, are good. It's a photograph that's bad. These are super volcanoes. We found them underneath the ocean. And what we also find in the ocean is we've just got a few kilometres of mid-ocean ridges where we're pulling apart the oceans. Only 64,000 kilometres, not fully explored. We have thousands of volcanoes that we've recognised there. Thousands of volcanoes off those ridges. Even more so, there was some recent work done with only 39 million kilometres of traverses in the ocean, showing that there are a few volcanoes sitting on the ocean floor that are not on these ridges and not on fault structures. These are the seamounts. There's only three and a half million of these. And what do these do? These leak out carbon dioxide. What do they do? They give heat. What do they do? They precipitate hot spring deposits. We've been down there and had a look at them. So the volcanoes that we see on Earth today are adding a huge amount of heat to the oceans and adding gases. And how many monitoring stations do we have on volcanoes that are submarine? Absolutely none. So we really don't know what's going on in the ocean and we've got to go back in time. And by going back in time, we can see that some extraordinary things happen. So here we've got some modern hot springs on the ocean floor. Four photographs, two of them are in deep water where we have liquid carbon dioxide. The other two um, have gaseous carbon dioxide. The one bottom right is from Papua New Guinea. Shallow water, carbon dioxide bubbling out. So here you've got liquid carbon dioxide in deep ocean waters. You never hear about that in the IPCC calculations. And we find that ocean floor rocks undergo change. We can drill them, which we've done, down to about five kilometres. Some of them have been pushed up onto continents. We see them in this country. We see them, the island of Cyprus, for example, is a piece of the ocean floor. We can actually walk through the ocean floor and we can do the experiments on the rocks and we can see that these rocks have been cooked up with water and we've taken carbon dioxide out of the water. That process gives out heat. So when you pump cold water through rocks, you actually create heat. So what's been happening on the ocean floor has been absolutely and totally ignored in all of the discussions about climate. And these are a very common rock type, they're called ophiolites, and we can measure thicknesses of them, they can be 5, 10 kilometres thick. So we can see it on today's ocean floor and we can see it on ancient oceans. We know we've got plenty of volcanoes sitting under ice. The, the pathetic little volcano erupting at present in Iceland, it is showing us how we humans live at the edge. We are so fragile, one very small eruption, and we have conniptions. Uh, in Antarctica, we have some very big volcanoes. The last uh, one erupted in Roman times. They're sitting underneath the ice. They're changing the shape of Antarctica, and they're pumping out greenhouse gases. They're also pumping out hydrofluoric acid and pumping out hydrochloric acid. What do they do? They destroy ozone. Which volcano is pumping out these gases, which we've measured? Mount Erebus. So there's a lot of things you never hear about in the IPCC studies because we geologists are just unloved. No one looks at our work. No, no one uh, thinks to look at geology. We have some fabulous observations of a dirty big earthquake in Iran in 1968 where we tore apart the, the crust of the earth and what came out? Warm water and carbon dioxide bubbling out through it. What do we see in faults where we've torn apart uh, rocks? Calcium carbonate, a rock that's got 44% carbon dioxide in it. There's other ways of squeezing material out of rocks. We bend them double. In the literature, they talk about rocks suffering deformation. I mean, have a look at that. They didn't suffer it. They really enjoyed that, getting bent double. <laughs> and coming out of that is water with carbonate in solution. And in those fractures, bottom photograph, we precipitate carbonate minerals. So every time we pull apart the earth or stitch it back together, we're moving carbon dioxide around. It's part of the carbon balance, which is never dealt with. We've pulled apart continents. This is an ancient continent, well before the um, ancient continents that some of you might know about. This was a continent of Rodinia. It was pulled apart about 800 million years ago. And we have bits of Rodinia where we've pulled it apart and had it 
react with the air. And when you have this reaction, a process of weathering, it's helped along by microorganisms, but you change rocks. And we know the chemistry of this. The, the experiments have been done. And in effect, when you have moist air and microorganisms reacting with rocks, especially basalt, you pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And here's an example of it. The darker material in the cutting is basalt, 830 million year old basalt from the pulling apart of the continent. The lighter material is carbonate. And we have this wonderful vegetation anomaly, this um, curly mallee that only grows on these rocks. So we can see this everywhere, that we're pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. We're storing it in rocks. It is no wonder that the global carbon dioxide content has been going down. It's only been going down for 2,500 million years, and it will continue to go down because we store it in limey rocks. We also store it in salt pans. This is Death Valley. There are carbonates where we've pulled calcium carbonate and sodium carbonate minerals and precipitated those, where have they got their carbon dioxide from? The atmosphere. What's helped them along the way? Microorganisms. So we're constantly pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. But what I find is the most interesting is looking at the great ice ages. One at two and a half thousand million years ago, the Huronian, the um, Cryogenian, that, that was one about 700 million years ago, and then a few others, we have six major ice ages. We are currently in an ice age which started some 34 million years ago. And we're just going in and out of glaciations and into glaciers. But we are in an ice age. It is absolutely inevitable that we are going to go back into another glaciation. It will be a Tuesday. We just don't know which one it'll be. But we are going to go back into another glaciation. And unless we can twiddle the dials and change the orbit of the Earth and change the sun, then we are going to have another glaciation. Now, these ice ages are really quite fascinating. We are told that carbon dioxide drives climate change. Well, sorry, folks. We've had six major ice ages. Each one of these ice ages was initiated when the carbon dioxide content was higher than now. The first two of them were when we had percent carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and yet we had ice at the equator and at sea level. Now, this is telling us straight away there is a disconnect. This is fabulous. How do these ice ages form? Well, certainly the one I want to go into in a second is, is it's very simple. We don't know. Now, isn't that fabulous? This is what science is about. Science is about many big questions. But we've got, in these ice ages, some carbonate rocks that grow on top of the debris left behind by the ice. And these are fascinating rocks. These are tillites. These are rocks where the ice has been retreating. Most of this part of the country is covered in material from retreating ice. Now, what happens is as the ice retreats and the meltwater starts to go through this material, you start to add nutrients to the oceans. And every time we've had a big ice age, we've had an explosion of life afterwards. There is a connection. Every time you freeze, you actually evolve. It's fabulous. Um, covering these rocks are carbonate rocks. Now, the fascinating thing about these rocks is that we find them with no continental, other continental sediments. We don't find them with marine sediments. We find them with deep ocean sediments and material that was on the continents. So we had no continental shelf. And then we've covered them with shallow limey rocks. So we must have had a continental shelf. And to do that, we must have had a sea level change of at least one and a half kilometres. So what are people having conniptions about a, a millimetre sea level rise? We've had some real sea level changes of at least a kilometre and a half. And these old glacial events tell us that. And what has happened is we've covered these glacial rocks with carbonates. The carbonate uh, in these older ones is dolomite. And we've got a lot of experiments on dolomite. And we can only form dolomite when we've got an extraordinarily high carbon dioxide content in the atmosphere. And we did. It was at least 5%, probably 30%. And we know that we had great changes in the salinity of the oceans because we, we've got some isotope evidence to show that. Now, if we're changing salinity, then we are really changing the way the oceans operate. We don't quite know what happened, but we do know that there was big changes in the salinity. And what we do know is that in past times, we have had up to 30% carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We did not have acid oceans. 
And we will have acid oceans when we run out of rocks. Because when we have seawater reacting with rocks, you buffer the seawater. It reacts with those new volcanic rocks on the floor of the oceans. It reacts with clays. You have borates that are buffering it. This has been known for decades. And all of this talk about acid oceans, firstly, people don't understand that something that pH 7.9 isn't quite acid. And the second thing is, uh, we've had much, much higher carbon dioxide contents in the past and we've had carbonate minerals precipitated, they haven't been dissolved because we've had buffering. And that buffering goes on and on and on. And these are some of those carbonate rocks. And this is in one of the, my favourite areas for geological work. And you can measure the thickness of these carbonates. All you've got to do is to wear a bit of leather off your boots. And these sequences of carbonates are seven kilometres thick. And you can walk along them along strike for 500 kilometres. Now that is a huge amount of, of carbon dioxide that's been pulled out of the atmosphere and dumped in these rocks. And this is where all that carbon dioxide went, when the planet had a very high carbon dioxide content. This process, these are dolomites, this process is taking place now because we have less carbon dioxide, we form calcium carbonate, calcite. So we have evidence written in stone. And just after that first big glacial event, um, we then left all this debris behind and, reach, and leached out nutrients from the meltwaters and we formed these weird and wonderful critters, the Ediacaran fauna. They didn't have shells, but th they were jellyfish type organisms and they, they were the first multicellular organisms on earth. Some of them had chordates, some of them backbones, the one at the top right is probably one of your distant relatives. Uh, a bit slimy, but many of mine are also. And, um, <laughs> This was the first life on Earth that was multicellular, and it was related to a climate change. That's fabulous. And then what happened? These formed in the Ediacaran. Then what happened is life got smart and started to pull calcium and CO2 out of the oceans and started to build shells. This is called the Cambrian explosion of life. It wasn't. It was an explosion of shells and skeletons. This was when we really started to sequester carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And this is a, a very familiar diagram in black showing that people have back calculated the amount of carbon dioxide. You do that from boring things like walking a few kilometres and measuring the thickness of limestone, working out that it's got 44% carbon dioxide in it, saying, OK, well, we've pulled all this carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and left it in the rocks. And you can see here we've got four of these glaciations, these uh, great uh, ice ages. Four of these ice ages started when we had more carbon dioxide than now. So when we use that absolutely wonderful, beautiful four-letter word time, we have to have a very different perspective on the way in which this planet operates. And we see that uh, most of, of the carbon cycle has been totally and absolutely ignored by the IPCC. And we have to have carbon dioxide. We wouldn't be here without carbon dioxide. Um, We've never seen in the past big and rapid climate changes that have been driven by carbon dioxide. Now, people have a, per a perception that geology, geological processes are slow. They're not. If there's an asteroid coming towards you, you don't even have time to look up and say, oh, shit, the thing's coming in. <laughs> it's coming in at 90,000 kilometres an hour. Now, that's the geological process. Other processes are slow. But some of them, like climate change, in the past have been extraordinarily rapid and with big temperature rises over short periods of time. So if you ignore my discipline, if you ignore my calling, what you get is an incomplete picture of the planet. And that's what we're being asked to believe, that our planet um, doesn't have a history. And what I find really quite interesting, the last point there is, we're being asked to believe that with all these other exhalations and emissions of carbon dioxide from the oceans and from volcanoes and other natural sources, only about 3 or 4% of it is of human origin. And really the challenge is to say, well, if you think humans are changing climate, you have to show me that that 3 or 4% of annual emissions drives climate. Don't worry about the rest. You have to show me that we humans do it. That's never been done. And I don't think it ever can be done. Uh, because we have a history, and our history is written in stone. And if we ignore time, we get a totally different view of the planet. Thank you.